Hi guys, welcome to Railways Explained. In this video, we discuss the rich history of American railways, as always, in a simple but comprehensive way. We will try to give you an overview of the development of the American railways from the beginnings until today, with a special focus on important dates in the history that lasts almost 200 years. Our main source for this video was the complete book of North American Railroading, written by Kevin U. Daly, Mike Schaffer, Steve Jezap, Jim Boyd, Steve Glishinsky, and Andrew McBride. So, special thanks to each of these gentlemen. In order to make this video easier, we divided American Rail history into three characteristic stages. The first is the beginning and the peak of the American Railroads from 1828 to 1916. The second is the period of competition and decline from 1916 to 1976, and the third is the railroad revitalization and regulatory reform from 1976 up to these days. Let's waste no more time and let's start with the video. Jamestown, the first permanent English settlement in what became the United States, was established in 1607. The next 200 plus years were spent settling and developing the continent, using only crude roadways and natural waterways. In the early 1800s, North Americans still moved around by horse, horse-drawn wagons, boats or by foot. However, shortly after the introduction of railways as a commercial transportation in England, they also found their use on the American soil. It is difficult to identify the first American railroad with certainty, but we will now mention few of these lines which have been put into operation one after the other in those early days. We'll start with Delaware and Hudson Canal and Gravity Railroad. Namely, brothers William and Maurice Wirtz owned a coal mine at Carbondale in Pennsylvania, and they were seeking for financial backing for a scheme to bring this new wonder coal into a new, untaped market. New York City. In 1823, they started activities to build their Delaware and Hudson Canal, but they still needed backing to complete tricky cross-mountain section between Oliphant and Honsdale. To accomplish this plan, it was necessary to construct a 17-mile railroad, where the coal cars were hauled up the mountain with a steam-powered winch and cable system. Delaware and Hudson Canal Company opened in 1828, and on August 8, 1829, this company experimented by operating the steam locomotive, brought over from England. This was the first time ever that a steam locomotive had operated on American rails, although it turned out to be too heavy, and subsequently was used as a stationary steam engine to drive the railroad's cabling system. In 1826, the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad became the first chartered railroad to actually be completed. The 17-mile railway served as a high-speed shortcut between the two cities that bypassed the slow and winding Erie Canal. The M&H opened in 1831. To link the Port of Baltimore and the Ohio River, the state of Maryland in 1827 chartered the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad the first section of which opened in 1830. As you can see, the objective of early American railroads was to connect bodies of water and to provide the missing links between the existing water routes. In the 1830s, the American railroad mania began. Given the unimaginable impact of railroads on shortening travel times and connecting people and markets, it is no wonder that 9,000 miles of railway lines have been built by 1850. The federal government also started the land grant scheme for railroad companies between 1855 and 1871, which tripled railroad mileage. And already by 1860, about 31,000 miles of railway routes was constructed. Railroads soon replaced many canals and turnpikes, and significantly displaced steamboats as well. The railroads were superior to these alternative modes of transportation, particularly water routes due to lower costs of transportation, the fact that canals and rivers were unavailable in the winter season, and because of the fact that railroads allowed shippers to have a smaller inventory of goods, which reduced storage costs. In 1861 began the first major conflict in the world in which railroads were a key weapon for both sides. The American Civil War Railroads played a significant role in deploying both materials and troops, which was especially important for the South, which had a smaller army. 
trains allowed soldiers to be quickly shifted between fronts, even if broadly separated. The Union used its much larger system more effectively, and practically all the mills, factories and supplying equipment were in the north. So the Union Railroad blockade kept the South from getting new equipment or spare parts. The war effectively ended on April 9, 1865, but beside Union's victory and cultural shift, this war was a turning point for the US railroads as well. During the Civil War, Congress passed the Pacific Railroad Acts in 1862 to build a transcontinental railroad to connect the Atlantic and the Pacific. The first transcontinental railroad, known originally as the Pacific Railroad and later the Overland Route, was a 1,912-mile continuous railroad line constructed between 1863 and 1869 that connected the existing U.S. rail network at Council Bluffs, Iowa with the Pacific Coast Oakland Long Wharf on San Francisco Bay. Railways Explained has already made a detailed video about the construction and the impact of the Transcontinental Railroad on the U.S. development, and we recommend you to check it out. In addition to the Transcontinental Railroad, the Civil War prompted integration and standardization of wild array of railroads that had mushroomed throughout the East, Southeast and Midwest. In the North alone, these railroads were using nearly a dozen different track gauges. As the Pacific Act decided that for Transcontinental Railroad the standard gauge needs to be used, it was decided that all future railroads would be 4 feet and 8 and a half inches. During the rest of the century, a vast majority of North American railroads standardized their track gauges and, as much as feasible, modified their existing locomotives and rolling stock. This rapid standardization was made possible by the so-called Reconstruction Era. The Reconstruction Era is the period of the American history that lasted from 1865 to 1877, following the American Civil War, and it marked a significant chapter in the history of civil rights in the United States. So, in the period from 1870 until 1880, about 40,000 miles of railroads were built, bringing the total network up to 93,267 miles. By 1880, every state and territory had the access to railway transportation. The US railroad industry was the nation's largest employer outside of the agricultural sector. The effects of the American railways on rapid industrial growth were many, including the opening of hundreds of millions of acres of high-quality farmland, lower costs of food and goods in general, a huge national sales market, the creation of a culture of engineering excellence, and the creation of the modern system of management. The next decade until 1890 brought one of the most rapid expansions where more than 70,000 miles of new lines were opened bringing the total network up to 163,597 miles. Ernst von Siemens demonstrated the first electric locomotive at the Berlin Industrial Exposition of 1879, and after 16 years, the first electrified section appeared in the United States. In 1895, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad electrified the three miles long section through the Howard Street Tunnel. It is also interesting to mention that, as a result of railroad overbuilding and shaky financing, which set off a series of bank failures, appeared the largest economic depression in the US history at the time, the so-called Panic of 1893. In total, one quarter of US railroads had failed by mid-1894, representing over 40,000 miles, but acquisitions of the bankrupt companies later led to further consolidation of ownership. As of 1906, two-thirds of railroads in the United States were controlled by only seven entities, with the New York Central, Pennsylvania Railroad and J.P. Morgan having a largest share. Industrialists such as Morgan, Cornelius Vanderbilt and Jay Gould became wealthy through the railroad business, as large railroad companies such as Grand Trunk Railway and the Southern Pacific Transportation Company spanned several states. In response to monopolistic practices and other excesses of some railroads and their owners, Congress passed the Interstate Commerce Act, created the Interstate Commerce Commission, in 1887. The Interstate Commerce Commission was a regulatory agency with original purpose to regulate railroad market by ensuring fair rates, eliminating rate discrimination, etc. As development of rail systems continued, by 1916, the railroad mileage hit its historic peak of 254,037 miles, 
with over 1,200 railroad carriers. The railroads at the time employed a force of more than 1.7 million workers. As you can see on illustration, from this moment the railroad mileage begins its steady decline. In addition, the American railways were temporarily nationalized due to the First World War. On April 6, 1917, the US House of Representatives voted 373 to 50 in favor of adopting a war resolution against Germany. In just five days after the United States entered the war, railroad executives had formed the Railroad War Board, pledging to help the war effort and to keep operations running. But these efforts weren't enough, and President Woodrow Wilson appointed William McCado as a director of the United States Railroad Administration. The government took control over nearly all U.S. railroads, and on March 21, 1918, Congress passed the Railroad Control Act, in order to guarantee a railroad carrier's rental would not exceed its average net operating income for the previous three years. This kind of centralized management led to standardization of equipment, reductions of duplicative passenger services, and a better coordination of freight traffic. Although the First World War ended on November 11, 1918, federal control of the railroads ended in March 1920. Railways Explained also made a video about the role of the railways in the First World War, and we also recommend you to check that one out. While the damage caused by the war was being repaired in Europe, as well as the construction of new infrastructure, something else was happening in America. Americans began acquiring automobiles as far back as 1920s. In 1916, there were only 3 million motor vehicles registered in the United States, but by 1929, there was over 23 million. As roads improved during the 20s and 30s, the rail passenger traffic began a steady decline. Railroads carried 1 billion passengers in 1916, which is close to 100% of the people who made intercity journeys. This figure by 1930 has dropped to 700 million and to 450 million by 1940. World War II stopped the decline because the war increased demand for rail passenger and freight traffic. During the war years from 1941 to 1945, the railways transported 90% of military supplies and moved 97% of military personnel. In addition, the railroads picked up extra passenger and freight traffic that the roads couldn't handle, due to funding cuts and gas rationing. In four years, passenger mileage climbed from 23.8 billion to an astronomical 95.6. As for freight trains, ton mileage from 292 billion before the war skyrocketed to 740 billion just before war sent. But during the war, private car ownership continued its upward trend, and lobby of major US car manufacturers was getting stronger. In addition, the President Dwight Eisenhower was influenced by his experiences in 1919 as a young soldier crossing the United States, and his appreciation of the German Autobahn network led to the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, also known as the National Interstate and Defense Highways Act. This act envisaged the plan of construction of what would become 46,837 miles of highways with a cost of staggering $114 billion. Airlines also took a huge step toward dominance with the introduction of the first jet service. Within the United States, national airlines became the first to begin jet service, using leased Boeing 707s on December 10, 1958. American Airlines offered the first domestic jet service using its own aircraft on January 25, 1959, with a flight from New York to Los Angeles. With this on the table, we can say that the railroad was knocked out. As the air and road systems grew, passengers deserted the passenger trains. Some railroads, such as Lehigh Valley and Southern Pacific, were quick to throw in the towel on their passenger trains, while others remained optimistic, buying new cars and promoting their trains. But by the late 1960s, even the optimists had to face reality. Passenger trains were wasting money. Freight services suffered too. As more highways were completed, the trucking industry found it easy to compete with railroads, and thus freight profits were difficult to come by especially in the East and Midwest. The short distances between cities in these areas left railroads especially vulnerable to strong competition from trucks. 
Western railroads with longer distances between cities were able to bring in more cash by moving freight farther and largely remained profitable. One strategy adopted specially by Eastern and Midwestern railroads was to cut costs through deferred maintenance, preserving cash by cutting back on repair budgets. In addition to all these problems, railway companies also had to deal with the Interstate Commerce Commission. The ICC had the power to determine maximum reasonable rail rates. As railroads lost money, the ICC was frequently an impediment to raising rates or eliminating unprofitable services. The railroads, faced with dwindling market share, overbuilt system and heavy-handed government regulation, sought to cut costs by merging among themselves. First such case was merging of the two rival companies in 1960. Erie and Lackawanna merged to form the Erie Lackawanna. Norfolk and Western absorbed the Virginian in 1959 and purchased the Akron, Canton and Youngstown and Pittsburgh and West Virginia in 1964. As some passenger transport companies, most notably Penn Central and the Central Railroad of New Jersey and other eastern railroads were coming apart, Congress addressed the passenger train problem. Namely, in 1970, the Congress passed the Rail Passenger Service Act, which created the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, known better by its marketing name, Amtrak. It is a common misconception that Amtrak is simply another government agency. It's actually a public-private railroad company that receives taxpayers' funding to offset any losses. Amtrak assumed operation of about half of the remaining intercity passenger trains in the United States on May 1, 1971. Amtrak turned out to be surprisingly popular and remains in business even today, although not at profit. With Amtrak picking up the passenger losses, Congress began to turn its attention to the ills facing the freight side of the business. In that sense, President Ford signed the Railroad Revitalization and Regulatory Reform Act on February 5, 1976. The Railroad Revitalization and Regulatory Reform Act from 1976 is often called the 4R Act. This federal law established the basic outlines of regulatory reform in the railroad industry and provided transitional operating funds following the 1970 bankruptcy of Penn Central Transportation Company. The law approved the final system plan for the newly created Conrail and authorized the acquisition of Northeast Corridor tracks and facilities by Amtrak. To preserve rail service in the Northeast, the federal government purchased the bankrupt Penn Central and other Northeastern railroads and created Conrail, formerly the Consolidated Rail Corporation. With this move, the government took control over the potentially profitable lines of multiple bankrupt carriers. Large shippers also wish to have more flexibility in the rail market. The net result of a compromise between the carriers and the shippers and the Carter's administration's push for a more competitive transport was the Staggers Act from 1980. America has the greatest economic system in the world. Let's reduce government interference and give it a chance to work. President Jimmy Carter used this line during his 1979 State of the Union address to request the regulation of the freight rail industry. The Staggers Act worked from the 4R Act template but extended its provisions. This act eliminated most of the rate regulation, allowed railroads and shippers to sign confidential contracts, and established time limits for regulators to approve discontinuations of unprofitable services and mergers. After rail regulations were lifted by the 4R Act and the Staggers Act, Conrail began to turn profits during the 1980s, and it was soon privatized in 1987. CSX Transportation and Norfolk Southern Railway agreed to acquire the system and split it into two roughly equal parts. The result of the regulation was a leaner, profitable U.S. rail industry. Railroads were now freer than ever to merge, and in the 1980s, merger mania struck the industry. Half a century ago, any railroad that turned at least $1 million a year was a Class 1 company, and there were more than 100 companies with such earnings. According to the current regulations, Class 1 is defined as having annual operating revenues of at least $490 million. Today, as a result of mergers, there are just seven Class 1 companies. Two of them, Canadian National and Canadian Pacific, are based in Canada, while the rest are based in the United States. 
You can see on the screen those five American Class 1 railroad companies and their mergers. The impact of Stagger's Act was incredible. As you can see, it has grown productivity and volume of transportation, caused rates to decrease, and, what is interesting, resulted in a growth of income, but only after a long period of time. Free from artificial controls, railroads once again became profitable, and billions of dollars were invested each year into growing and modernizing America's privately owned rail network. At the same time, shippers have seen a dramatic decrease in rates. Between 1981 and 2013, the average rate fell 43%, adjusted for inflation. According to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, Class 1 railroads in 2018 had operating revenues of $76 billion and operating expenses of $50.8 billion. In 2018, these companies achieved 476.2 million train miles. Having in mind we already spent too much time, it is time to conclude this video. As we mentioned, in the US, the majority of passenger trains are operated by Amtrak. Amtrak receives federal funding for the vast majority of its operations. Also, Amtrak receives funding from 18 states through 21 agencies for 29 short-distance routes. Continued operation of these state-supported routes is subject to annual operating agreements. There is just one non-Amtrak provider of passenger services in the United States. Brightline. Brightline is a higher speed train run by All Aboard Florida. It is the United States only privately owned and operated intercity passenger railroad. We also dedicated a special video to this company and its extension plans. On the other side, a competitive freight industry has increased efficiency over the years, with the main catalyst being deregulation. Commercial freedom in this case showed to be successful in raising efficiency and performance, but it took many years before revenues started showing progress. This might indicate something well known in Europe. The reform of railways is a long-lasting and painful process. But it has to be done. In any case, this was an overview of the history of the American railroads by Railways Explained. At the end of this video, we could mention that American railroads are likely to enter a new era with the arrival of Amtrak Joe as the President of the United States. Namely, he presented a new and ambitious infrastructure plan for the United States, which envisages a significant amount of investments for the railway sector. This $2 trillion plan would set aside $621 billion for transportation, which is among the plan's top priorities. This was all for today, we hope you enjoyed and learned something new about the railways of the world. Don't forget to like this video, share it with your real loving friends and of course subscribe to our channel. Until the next time, goodbye.